our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we will enjoy visits to three different gems of the European continent. Starting off in the north, we will explore the pristine mountains of Lapland. From there, we will attempt to conquer the peaks of the Swiss Alps. From the Alps of Switzerland, we will go to France where, in the wine region known as Champagne, they know a thing or two about making the best wines in the world. Then, we will end today's adventure in Gibraltar, one of the pillars of the ancient world. But first, the unspoiled mountains of Lapland beckon. Welcome to Lapland and one of the most scarcely populated regions in Europe. Just over two million people live here on an area equivalent in size to Japan. Lapland isn't an independent state. Some of Lapland actually spreads over territory belonging to Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. We enter Lapland via the largest town of northern Norway, Tromsø. It is from here that the famous Norwegian polar explorer, Raud Amundsen, set out on his expeditions. Today, the port of Tromsø is renowned mostly for its abundance of seafood. Salmon has about the same market value here as bread. The most recognizable creature spotted quite often in Lapland is the reindeer. Whether you believe in Santa or not, you ought to give way to reindeer on the roads. Wild reindeer weigh about 150 kilos. The locals will be sure to warn you to steer clear of them. Reindeer have short, thick coats that serve as the perfect protection against cold and dampness. Reindeer are capable of covering up to 160 kilometers a day and they are surprisingly great swimmers. In the northern part of Lapland, it is easy to get carried away by the sheer beauty of the Norwegian fjords. Here, the coast has been shaped into a bizarre system of bays and inlets. There is only one other place on the planet where this type of coast can be found, in South America, in the country of Chile, on the opposite side of the globe. Fjords are created in mountainous regions that are in close proximity to the sea. In order to develop, they require the continuous pressure of advancing glaciers combined with the deepening of river valleys. In these waters, fishermen will find both common salmon and the Atlantic salmon. Both species of salmon make the water of the fjords their home. Some of the fjords are tens of kilometers long. Most of Lapland lies beyond the Arctic Circle. Therefore, in the northernmost parts of Lapland, the sun never quite sets during the summer solstice and never rises above the horizon during the winter solstice. Should you feel that you are incapable of dealing with all your chores on a normal day, you should try this out. Your biorhythm is hugely different here. The polar summer, a time of the never-ending day, commences from the middle of May and goes through the end of August. During this period, the sun resembles a tennis ball flying over the net, never disappearing beyond the horizon. Instead, it just bounces right back. It is called the midnight sun. Those who consider Lapland to be the land of snow and ice are mistaken. Even here, nature happily offers pleasing views of spring meadows in bloom. In winter, the red signs serve as necessary orientation points for snowmobiles. In the summertime, however, the cable car is a more convenient mode of transport. Take this cable car up to Mount Nula. During the two kilometer ascent, the passengers admire breathtaking vistas of Nordic landscapes, uniquely devoid of human beings. Here, 
it takes a small miracle to encounter another human being. Thousands of tourists from around the world flock to myriad nature reservations in Lapland, clamoring only to admire its unspoiled beauty. They leave with memories of immense lakes, countless rivers and brooks, dense forests, beautiful mountains, and deep valleys. Many believe that experiencing the magic of the local nature is akin to an intense cleansing experience, normally associated only with a health or relaxation spa. We will conclude our trek through the vastness of Lapland by visiting the Finnish village of Nelim. Nelim lies on the shores of the largest lake in Lapland, Lake Inari. Its northern shores are referred to as the real Lapland. If you are lucky, you may encounter a genuine Sami. Unfortunately, there are only 70,000 members of this culture remaining in the whole of Lapland. At this time of year, the lengthy day is nowhere near its end just yet. However, we are running out of time. So let's bid farewell to the land of the midnight sun and head south to a warmer climate. Switzerland welcomes you with the heartfelt tunes of its national instrument, the Alpine horn. The horn is almost as evocative of Switzerland as chocolate, watches, and cheese. It is inherently linked to the local landscape, made up of mountains and mist. This confederation of 26 cantons in the very center of Europe can boast of having Europe's highest mountain, the highest concentration of financiers in the world, and Swiss precision. Switzerland is just as well known for its charming miniature models. 27 miniatures made to the scale of 1 to 25 can be viewed here. The miniatures are exact replicas of Swiss fortresses, cable cars, and railways. The legend has it that these miniatures are the works of elves and goblins. The truth is that the Swiss have all of these models manufactured in France. To truly enjoy some of Switzerland's splendor, it may be necessary to overcome 4,000 meter peaks, an ordeal that may take up the better part of an hour, with a little help from some machinery, of course. Reaching the peaks takes a cogway. The cogway is a very special lift that uses cogs. The one seen here happens to be the steepest one in the world. It overcomes inclines of up to 48 degrees and has been in operation since the end of the 19th century. Sweeping views signify the end of the peaceful journey through the rock massifs. From the summit of Pilat, the mountain towering above Luzerne and what is believed to be the final resting place of Pontius Pilate, we can see almost all of Switzerland. That is, if the valleys aren't veiled in fog or mist. The residents of Luzerne have an explanation for this haze. Legends say that because dragons have become fond of the mountain, they linger in the area, unleashing fiery vapors and causing the fog and mists to become dense. When it comes to ecology, the Swiss are a lot more advanced than their neighbors. The mass usage of trains alone is a significant indicator of their close relationship to nature. A typical example of Swiss ecological thinking is the creation of the auto verladon, trains that transport cars through tunnels. And because you're in Switzerland, you could easily set your watch by the precision of the train's schedule. From Kleine Scheidegg, we can use the cogway to reach the highest situated European railway station. It terminates at the respectable altitude of 3,500 meters above sea level and hides in the Jungfrau Joch Gap. This cogway overcomes a super elevation of 1,400 meters up to four times a day. The returning journeys are the quietest ones. The passengers are dazed by the low oxygen content in the air and, as a result, often fall asleep. There is a network of tunnels for the pedestrians leading from the terminal station to the summit. Most of these are carved in ice. It is hardly surprising 
given that the highest concentration of glaciers in continental Europe is right here in the Swiss Alps. The mountain Jungfrau, meaning virgin, neighbors with mountains called Hunter and Monk. The question arises then, how come she is still a virgin when a hunter is nearby? The logical answer is, because a monk stands between them. The ice cave, also called the palace in Jungfrau, lies deep beneath masses of ice. It is a world of utter silence and repose, and is the perfect venue for the exhibition of ice sculptures. The glacier moves a little each year, and so the cave has to be repaired continuously so as to prevent it from caving in. Unfortunately, the greatest threat to the caves are the visitors. More specifically, their body heat and breath create a thermal problem. The Greenland Husky is a happy resident of the mountain slopes. Its initial purpose was to deliver provisions and mail to the summits. These dogs are still here. Halfway up the mountain, at about 2,300 meters above sea level, is a breeding station that was established over 70 years ago. The resident pack of dogs are the best in the world. These dogs have a very discernible and prized lineage. Their direct ancestors were the first to conquer the North Pole. The Great Aletsch Glacier in the Bernese Alps is the longest glacier in the Alps. Its course of 24 kilometers ends in the very south of Switzerland. Its area has been diminishing dramatically over the last 20 years. The Bernese Alps are the largest and the most significant mountain range in Switzerland and throughout the European continent. The mountain range is distinguished by its significant degree of glaciation. It is time to head off to the Wallace region, which lines 40 peaks exceeding 4,000 meters. The fantastic pistes are as much a lure as Swiss cheese. The Swiss are true masters in this domain. They rotate the manufacture of three types of cheese here. Brignon for raclette, the smaller, semi-soft Tomé, and the soft Ciroc. Raclette is one of the Swiss cheese specialties. It is melted cheese served with hot, unpeeled potato chips. Wallace is the largest wine canton in Switzerland due to its spread over 5,000 hectares. Today, over 50 different kinds of wine are cultivated here. The snow caps took the wine growers by surprise. The grapes are peeking from beneath their white cover, and many a wine grower looks forward to ice wine. The sight of vineyards, though, serves as a reminder that our time in Switzerland is up and that it is high time to head off to one of Europe's loveliest regions. We are off to explore the region that gave its name to the most famous wine in the world. Vineyards in autumn hues, a view out of this world. It is just the way many of us imagine the legendary wine region of Champagne, nothing but wine bushes stretching in between horizons. In reality, wine can only be cultivated in a few selected areas. This elite selection makes up just under 2% of the Champagne Ardennes area. It was the ancient Romans that first planted wine here in the 5th century. They felt that the area bore a strong resemblance to the Italian Campania. That created the origin of the region's name. The Champagne wine growers were faced with a long and tiring battle against the prevailing natural conditions before Champagne as we know it today became the world's favorite liquid with which to toast special occasions. Champagne originated most likely by accident. It was a natural process. After primary fermentation and bottling, a second alcoholic fermentation occurs in the bottle. Nowadays, a single method called the Method Champenois is used. The grape juice, extracted using only the pressure by hand, is allowed to become regular wine first. The bubbles occur in the next phase. Carbon dioxide is released from the casks into the surrounding air during fermentation. The wine is subsequently bottled with sugar added to ensure the secondary fermentation. 
That corked bottle is then laid to rest in a wine cellar for several months. There are some 450 villages in Champagne where champagne is made and each one has a slightly different taste. This is Lac du Dare. With a surface area of 48 square kilometers, it is Europe's largest man-made lake. Its weirs, or barriers, protect Paris from floods, and the water from the River Seine is controlled from here. Even though this isn't a natural lake, fauna abounds here. The conservationists are aware of its importance to bird migration. The migrating birds either winter over or nest here. When these elegant birds cluster together, it is a sight worth seeing and something that cannot be missed by passionate ornithologists. The only ones not all that enthusiastic about the birds are local farmers. The cranes attack surrounding fields each morning to feed on bulbs, roots, and other sources of digestible energy. Thankfully, the birds are protected, and so the farmers can only helplessly observe. And so nature lovers may take pleasure in watching squadrons of migrating birds each fall. The tranquility, the comparatively cheap lifestyle, the good wine, and the pretty country girls are what likely attracted many artists to the region. The painter, Pierre-Auguste Renoir, was doubtlessly the best known among them. Unique colors and quality of light kept him busy. A job well done was rewarded by another local delicacy, one that grows underground. The dogs are trained for a very specific task, finding truffles. Sociable breeds, such as Labradors and Shepherds, are commonly used for this purpose. Hunting dogs are not suitable. Despite the high value of truffles, the making of champagne is still the primary business activity of this region. The market value of champagne truffles is currently about $500 per kilo. The window of opportunity to collect truffles is rather short, only the few weeks from the end of September to the beginning of December. It is important that the ground is not frozen more than two to three centimeters under the surface, or else the planters may bid their bounty goodbye. We can only envy their autumn dog-walking strolls through breathtaking nature in search of one of the world's most sought-after gastronomic treasures. One of the largest towns of the region is Reims. It bears a rich history and, as such, is a favorite tourist attraction. The knight you see here is actually Joan of Arc. It was as a result of her visions and her determination that Charles VII was declared the King of France in 1429. This was the time when all of Europe was fixated by the Reims Cathedral. The building of the Notre Dame Cathedral, dedicated to the Virgin Mary, began in the 8th century on the foundations of another cathedral built 400 years earlier. It was here that most French kings were crowned. 38 heads of state in all lived to see their anointment here. The tradition was initialized by the French king Clovis I, the first king of the Franks to unite all the Frankish tribes under one ruler. He was baptized right here towards the end of the 5th century by Saint Remigius, for the next thousand years, his successors traveled to Reims to be anointed by the coronation oil from the Sant Ampule. Through this act, they became knights and so could fulfill the motto of their calling, to rule is to serve. It is quite remarkable that this motto is still followed today. Historical events are what will be at the center of today's final destination. Gibraltar welcomes you. It is the southernmost cape of Europe, almost touching Africa. A cradle of history, Gibraltar is a strategic strait and an important shipping crossroad. It is also the only British overseas territory on the old continent. And even if it may seem irrelevant, it is also the only part of Europe where monkeys live naturally. We crossed the Spanish border in a village quite significantly called Linie, and out of nowhere we materialized in the United Kingdom. 
Spain was forced to concede Gibraltar to Britain in 1713 under the Treaty of Utrecht, which concluded the war. The Spanish never quite accepted this, but in a referendum in 1967 and again in 2002, the Gibraltarians voted overwhelmingly to remain under British sovereignty. During the last attempt of Spain to retake Gibraltar in the years 1779 to 1783, the British dug out a 113-meter-long tunnel into the rock while under siege. This tunnel enabled them to bombard the Spanish from atop the mountain. What we are seeing here is a cloud that is inseparably linked to the rock of Gibraltar. The cloud is known as Levanta. When the wind blows from the east, the cloud is trapped on the rock peak and forms one of the most recognized symbols of Gibraltar. The rock of Gibraltar is used as a resting place by great numbers of migrating birds en route from Africa. There are about 270 different kinds of birds found here. There is no source of water on the rock. Even so, it is covered in vegetation. Over 600 different plants, ferns, and lichens grow here, six of which grow nowhere else in Europe. Nature tackled the lack of water on the rock with admirable ease. The plants actually desalinate seawater. That is one of the reasons the rock of Gibraltar is considered a very unique formation, not only from the geopolitical point of view, but also from the biological perspective. These members of the animal kingdom are no less unique, as this happens to be the one and only colony of monkeys living freely on the European continent. These monkeys are Barbary macaques. No one knows exactly how they got to Gibraltar, but there are countless theories on the matter. Locals think highly of the monkeys despite their shameless cheekiness with which they rob tourists of their snacks. There is a saying that as long as the monkeys remain, Gibraltar will stay British. There's gotta be something to this. During World War II, none other than Winston Churchill himself ordered that the dwindling numbers of monkeys in Gibraltar be replenished. Today, the monkeys are safeguarded by the Helping Hand organization. Because the macaques are extremely tame, they face a difficult problem. People spoil the monkeys with various treats, which are often harmful to them. The organization's director would prefer that all human contact with the monkeys were banned. However, such a ban could easily eliminate one of the major attractions bringing tourists to Gibraltar. Let us now retreat into the interior of the St. Michael's Cave. It is an extensive stalactical labyrinth. People believed that the cave was bottomless. A legend exists about an underwater tunnel leading all the way to Africa. The legend is not based on fact. However, an unexplained mystery prevails. Sometime around the year 1840, a Lieutenant Mitchell, along with another officer, were seen luring themselves into the cave, never to come out. A hundred years later, a thorough forensic investigation found no human remains. This British piper of Nepalese origin will see us off on today's final stop. It is the southernmost point of Gibraltar, referred to by the locals as Europa Point. Its name signifies the fact that this is where Europe ends. Gibraltar has always been a very strategic place. The Strait of Gibraltar separates the Atlantic Ocean from the Mediterranean Sea. To the north lies Spain and Gibraltar. To the south lies Morocco and the Spanish town of Ceuta. The lighthouse truly may claim to be one at the very end of the world. And it is the lighthouse that bids us farewell. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we will travel to the very north of Great Britain the Shetland Islands. Here, a million birds watch as the human population, numbering only 20,000, gets on with their everyday lives. We will then travel from the very end of the world to its very center, 
The local nomadic dervishes called the Pshibalchashi region in the southeastern province of Kazakhstan, Almaty, the center of the world. Later, we will follow our camera to the Yellow Mountains in central China and the Chengkang, known as the Venice of China. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us.